Okay, so today is the last day of my readings this week, and uh, continuing on the fleshing out of uh, uh, Sariputta's expositions on right view, and uh, this one is on the topic of becoming. And um, in Pali, it's bhava, and uh, becoming, being, existence, and it's translated in many different ways. <coughs> and the first sutta that I will read is... Uh, Ankutra, from Ankutra 3, Sutta number 76, and the, and the title is Existence, or Bhava. Then the Venerable Ananda approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side, and said to him, Bhante, it is said, existence, existence. In what way, Bhante, is there existence? In this... Uh, Sutta, or in this, in the footnote, uh, there is a, a footnote on that, say the term existence, and the, the name is Bawa, and uh, the word is Bawa. So what is meant is a concrete state of individual existence in one of the three realms. Nibbana is called Bawa Niroda, the cessation of individual existence. If and under there were no kamma ripening in the sensory realm. Would sense fear existence be discerned? No, Bhante. Thus, Ananda, for beings hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving, kamma is the field, consciousness is the seed, and craving the moisture for their consciousness to be established in an inferior realm. In this way, there is the production of renewed existence in the future. If, Ananda, there were no kamma ripening in the form realm, would form sphere existence be discerned? No, Bhante. Thus, Ananda, for beings hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving, kamma is the field, consciousness is the seed, and craving the moisture for their consciousness to be established in the middling realm. In this way, there is the production of renewed existence in the future. If, Ananda, there were no kamma ripening in the formless realm, would formless sphere existence be discerned? No, Bhante. Thus, Ananda, for beings hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving, kamma is the field, consciousness the seed, and craving the moisture for their consciousness to be established in the superior realm. In this way, there is the production of renewed existence in the future. It is in this way, Ananda, that there is existence. So in this sense, um, say the different levels of... Uh, and sense existence is the uh, basically the animal realm, human realm, hell realms, lower spheres of existence. So it's just, and then the form realm is... And then some of the lower... Deva realms as well um, are the sense fear existence, and then, uh, but then your your Deva realms or more refined Deva realms are the form sphere existence, and then the, uh, the formless sphere existence are the say the resulting the resultant of the uh, formless jhanas. So that would be the kamma, and then that that sense of the. You know, in the same way that, say, like contact uh, is the conjunction of the sense sphere itself, the say, like the, the external. Uh, the, so, in terms of there's the eye, there's the forms that I, and then the eye consciousness, the three coming together are contact. So, in the same way, existence or the the bhava becoming or being um, existence is maybe not the greatest word because it does tend to feel a bit static as a uh, you know as an object or as a, a thing but uh, say they've struggled with defining this for 
uh, the word Bawa since since the early days of discovering that Pali was a was a language. But it's that uh, so come as the feel consciousness, the seed, craving, the moisture. So these three, these things coming together, and uh, the come uh, volition, the movement of the mind, the jetana, uh, in a particular direction, and then consciousness itself, and then craving. Uh, that seeking for a, a coarse realm to abide in, seeking a, uh, a more refined realm to, to, to abide in, seeking a, uh, a su- truly superior realm to abide in is the, is the, uh, the movement toward, the craving toward. So that, that uh, uh, this, this sense of being, becoming, uh, and understand, of course, this is understanding that that as a uh, as a part of right view, because you know, oftentimes we feel that we're afflicted by the world, uh, uh, or the world uh, is somehow foisted upon me, uh, and in reality, it's that bhava, that, that movement of becoming toward certain spheres of 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 existence and being that uh, land us wherever we are uh, and then we complain about it so <laughs> we're not satisfied by it <laughs> and there is a other sutta that illustrates this a little bit more it kind of illustrates that say that movement um, and this is uh, sangyutta t- uh, 22, Sutta number 54, it's called Seeds. At Savati, because there are these five kinds of seeds. What five? Root seeds, stem seeds, joint seeds, cutting seeds, and germ seeds as the fifth. And the, 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 word, is, the word for seed is bija, and it is a, uh, bija is more like, a, say, as opposed to an actual seed. Uh, it is the uh, maybe five means of propagation. If these five kinds of seeds are unbroken, unspoiled, undamaged by wind and sun, fertile, securely planted, but there is no earth or water, would these five kinds of seeds come to growth, increase, and expansion? No, venerable sir. If these five kinds of seeds are broken, spoiled, damaged by wind and sun, unfertile, not securely planted, but there is earth and water, would these five kinds of seeds come to growth, increase, and expansion? No, venerable sir. If these five kinds of seeds are unbroken, unspoiled, undamaged by wind and sun, fertile, securely planted, and there is earth and water, would these five kinds of seeds come to growth, increase, and expansion? Yes, Venerable Sir. Because the four stations of consciousness should be seen as like the earth element, delight and lust should be seen as like the water element. Consciousness together with its nutriment should be seen as like the five kinds of seeds. Consciousness, because while standing, might stand engaged with form, based upon form, established upon form, with a sprinkling of delight, it might come to growth, increase, and expansions. Or consciousness, while standing, might stand engaged with feeling, engaged with perception, engaged with volitional formations. Based upon volitional formations, established upon volitional formation, with a sprinkling of delight, it might come to growth, increase, and expansion. Because though someone might say, apart from form, apart from feeling, apart from perception, apart from volitional formations, I will make known the coming and going of consciousness, its passing away and rebirth, its growth, increase, and expansion. That is impossible. Because if a bhikkhu has abandoned lust for the form element, with the abandoning of lust, the basis is cut off. There is no support for the establishing of consciousness. If he has abandoned lust for the feeling element, for the perception element, for the volitional formations element, for the consciousness element, with the abandoning of lust, the basis is cut off. There is no support for the establishing of consciousness. 
When that consciousness is unestablished, not coming to growth, non-generative, it is liberated. By being liberated, it is steady. By being steady, it is content. By being content, he is not agitated. Being unagitated, he personally attains Nibbāna. He understands. Destroyed is birth. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. So just uh, yeah, fleshing out on that. Mm, you know, how does this consciousness, this being, this existence, uh, uh, becoming? How does that? Uh, how does that work? And that, that's just just that sense. In the same, the Buddha is sort of comparing that to the. Uh, different types of propagation in nature. It's a, a natural process. And then the last sutta that I will read uh, uh, is Anguttara 4's sutta number 10 called Bonds. Uh, because there are these four bonds, and bonds in this sense is, uh, is yoga, uh, but it's also um, I mean, the bond of sensuality, the bond of existence, the bond of views, and the bond of ignorance. I mean, there's also, in not in the early sutta, I don't think in the, I don't think it's found in the early sutta expositions, but in the very early, um, later books of the uh, of the of the Tipitaka that. Then they began to talk about, say, the asavas. So the asavas of sensuality, of 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 being, becoming, of existence, uh, of ignorance, and then the it was uh, added the, uh, the 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 asavas of of uh, of views. So that uh, it's 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 kind of on a certain level, it's kind of, uh, the it is a a form of being and becoming. Uh, we take our stand of being and becoming on particular views. Uh, but uh, uh, that was, anyway, that's my recollection. And what bhikkhus is the bond of sensuality? Here someone does not understand as they really are the origin and the passing away, the gratification, the danger, and the escape in regard to sensual pleasures. When one does not understand these things as they really are, then sensual lust, sensual desire, sensual affection, sensual infatuation, sensual thirst, sensual passion, sensual attachment, and sensual craving lie deep within one in regard to sensual pleasures. This is called the bond of sensuality. Such is the bond of sensuality, and how is there the bond of existence? Here someone does not understand, as they really are, the origin and the passing away, the gratification, the danger, and the escape in regard to states of existence. When one does not understand these things as they really are, then lust for existence, delight in existence, affection for existence, infatuation with existence, thirst for existence, passion for existence, attachment to existence, and craving for existence lie deep within one in regard to states of existence. This is called the bond of existence. Such are the bond of sensuality and the bond of existence. And how is there the bond of views? Here someone does not understand as they really are the origin and the passing away, the gratification, the danger, and the escape in regard to views. When one does not understand these things as they really are, then lust for views, delight in views, affection for views, infatuation with views, thirst for views, passion for views, attachment to views, and craving for views lie deep within one in regard to views. This is called the bond of views. Such are the bond of sensuality, the bond of existence, and the bond of views. And how is there the bond of ignorance? Here someone does not understand, as they really are, the origin and the passing away, the gratification, the danger, and the escape in regard to the six bases for contact. When one does not understand these things as they really are, then ignorance and unknowing lie deep within one in regard to the six bases for contact. 
This is called the bond of ignorance. Such are the bond of sensuality, the bond of existence, the bond of views, and the bond of ignorance. One is fettered by bad, unwholesome states that are defiling, conducive to renewed existence, troublesome, ripening in suffering, leading to future birth, old age, and death. Therefore, one is said to be, quote, not secure from bondage, unquote. These are the four bonds. There are, because these four severances of bonds, what four, and of course it goes through the bond, all those different views, and it's the uh, understanding as they really are, uh, the origin, the passing away, the gratification, the danger, and the escape uh, in order to attenuate say, you know, lust and craving and infatuation and say the opposite of what was just been read or what was the bond. And then one is it is detached from bad, unwholesome states that are defiling, conducive to re renewed existence, troublesome, ripening in suffering, leading to future birth, old age, and death. Therefore, one is said to be, quote, secure from bondage. These are the four severances of bonds. And then the sutta ends with a, with a verse. Fettered by the bond of sensuality and the bond of existence, fettered by the bond of views, preceded by ignorance, beings go on in samsara, led on in birth and death. But having entirely understood sense pleasures and the bond of existence, having uprooted the bond of views and dissolved ignorance, the sages have severed all bonds. They have gone beyond bondage. So, um, uh, from all of these suttas, one, one gets a sense of just how important it is to understand that, that, that being, becoming, existence, bhava. Uh, as a part of uh, dependent origination and and to be able to you know, reflecting on the uh, arising passing away uh, the gratification the danger and the the escape uh, these are those are really important ways of reflection and investigation otherwise we end up uh, in yeah entangled and stuck uh, and that's and the buddha is offering a way out. So that's the suttas I had today. We continue with the uh, teachings of Ajahn Chah. And this begins the first, uh, we read the introduction from Ajahn Chah, and then the, the, uh, uh, this is uh, beginning this uh, hearing Dhamma. In teaching the Dhamma, things have to be repeated over and over for people to gain real understanding. This is normal. It's what has to be done in order to get the important points across. The words of the Buddha are called good speech because they lead people's minds to the truth. It is speech that is good and reasonable and full of meaning. When it really touches the mind, one desists from harming oneself and others and gives up the three poisons of desire, anger, and delusion. But some will hear it and call it wrong speech because it doesn't agree with their opinions and habits. Actually, the things that agree with sentient beings' minds are not always good. In our minds, there are concepts of right and wrong, but those things are uncertain. Good speech, however, is straight, direct, and upright. It is neither profound nor shallow. Rather, it is the speech of the Buddha, which has the purpose of reducing the emotional afflictions and getting free of delusion. Such words do not merely try to follow people's personal preferences. Some will say, if it disagrees with me, it isn't good speech, and it can't be dhamma. But it's not a matter of that which agrees being good and that which disagrees being bad. These are just preconceptions and biases the listener's habitual likes and dislikes. If we try to have everything agree with us, there will be no end to difficulty. We don't want to do anything disagreeable. Whatever we like, we will wish to embrace and act on it, no matter how much grief it brings. Poisonous food may be tasty, but there is a danger later on. Speech of the Buddha and of his disciples is all good. It is Dhamma. But when ordinary people hear it, 
they may not understand it easily if it is not presented in a way that can reach their minds. It is not easy to see or easy to practice. Any language is a tool to help us understand. Language is only language. If someone says just word of English to me, I don't have a clue what they're saying. And it has no value or meaning to me, even though it's a popular language now. Wherever we live, in whatever country, let us speak things that help us understand right and wrong clearly. This kind of speech is useful. It is Dhamma. But know that hearing Dhamma is for the purpose of the mind seeing and being Dhamma, not for mere knowledge or memorization. It should enable us to follow in the footsteps of the Buddha and practice according to what he taught. Even though we have not yet attained realization, we should put language to work and contemplate it. It's easy in a way. For example, the Buddha said laziness and negligence are not good. Having heard that, when you find them arising in your mind, as they will, you recognize and know them for what they are. Then you can escape from indolence and give rise to diligence. When laziness arises, it is nowhere but in the mind. When it comes, let it be a cause for practicing Dhamma, which means going against, reducing, and transforming this laziness. We listen to Dhamma to make our minds into Dhamma to let it arise in our minds. If it has not yet arisen, we strive to make it arise. It's not so difficult to practice. We just need to apply effort to make the mind pay attention and work like this. You want your mind to be Dhamma, not merely the sounds that come from your mouth. Don't keep the knowledge in your brain and in your mouth. Make the gates of body, speech, and mind consistent in Dhamma. Listening to Dhamma is for the purpose of knowing how to practice Dhamma. So if we say, practice to make a Dhamma, then what exactly is Dhamma? Everything in this world, something that is not Dhamma, does not exist. Forms that we can see with the eye are nothing but Dhamma. Beings in the world are all Dhamma. One meaning of Dhamma is nature, which arises just as it is and which nobody can fashion or alter. The nature of phenomena is Dhamma. This refers to objects, the world of forms. The Buddha said to see Dhamma and enter Dhamma, that is, to see all things as they really are. Living beings and material objects, as well as the inner phenomena of feeling and thinking, all this is Dhamma. There are these two categories, objects that can be seen by the eye or known by the other senses, and mind, which cannot be seen in that way. It is nothing far from us, just mind and body. But this Dhamma, this nature, arises independent of our wishes, from causes and conditions. In the middle it changes, and in the end it breaks up and disappears. The Dhamma of nature has power above all things. No one can request it to become greater or less. Natural things have their own mode of existing according to their causes. The Dhamma that we come to request, the precepts and teaching, is a tool to help us understand. The teaching is words. Dhamma does not exist in the words. Rather, the words are a path, something to point out the way to people, catch their minds, and lead them to know and realize Dhamma. So it is said that the teaching itself is not Dhamma. We hear with the ear and speak with the tongue, but that is not of ultimate value. These words and concepts are not Dhamma itself. If they were actually Dhamma, they would have an independent existence of their own above all things. So coming to understand Dhamma is just a matter of working to develop the wisdom to see things according to truth, rather than destroying or changing anything. Take the body as an illustration. It is born of causes and conditions. When it is born, it has a certain power, a law, to exist in a certain way, and doesn't listen to anyone. We were born, we were little, and we grew to adulthood and got older, our bodies changing according to their nature. They grow and age, no matter what anyone says, thinks, or wants. 
It doesn't do any good to cry and moan, to ask it to stop for even a day. In the beginning, it is born according to causes. It develops by conditions. And in the end, it will break up, not depending on anyone's wishes or orders. This is the nature of life, existing, existing by this unchanging law. So the Buddha taught us to look at this point. This is extremely important. Skin, teeth, hair, and the rest. What will you see there? Constant change. Having arisen, they seek their own end and go on decaying on their own. Having arisen, they do not depend on the power of beings, but on the power of the causes and conditions that brought them into existence. Having arisen, they decay in the same way. They don't need to ask permission or agreement of any of us to help them grow, age, wither, and die. This happens on its own. We don't have authority over them. This is form, the body, changing according to its own nature, dissolving, dissolving in the end. This is the Mahavadamma, or natural conditions. In any direction or place, there will never come a day when we can argue with it or tell it. Hey, listen to me. Pay attention to my cries. Don't get old. Do as I say. Nature is like this. It is part of the Dhamma that the Buddha taught. We are not these things, nor are we their owners. If our awareness of these truths is not clear, if instead we are deluded about nature, it is called the Dhamma of delusion. Then we see these things as self, as ours, and in terms of self and others. This is ignorance, and when there is ignorance, mental formations arise. We struggle with things we want to control to get this or avoid that, and fall prey to like and dislike. This is something I like. Please let me have more of it. That is something I can't stand. Please, don't let it come to me. This should be like that. That should be like that. Such thinking comes from delusion. You become like someone who tries to seize another's house and field, taking what is not really yours. The desires just keep on appearing in great heaps, and you won't even know where they came from or what they are leading you to do. Teaching and listening to Dhamma that this is such and that is such are not really Dhamma. They are words to point something out so that you can enter and see. Speaking to help people see the truth is skillful means or ways of teaching. The Dhamma of study. When it is only speech without actually seeing, when you merely want to learn the words to be able to repeat them, no benefit comes. When you apply the words and see that this is the way things are, the unchanging constant law arising according to causes and conditions without a self or essence, this is actually what the Buddha was teaching about. If you don't yet see, there is suffering. If you do see, you won't long for anything. There will be no more tears or laughter over things. We have been crying and laughing without end since we were little children. We have been insane, without rest, always trying to get something that is not ours, always in contention, desiring something we can never really get, we're always living in a state of dissatisfaction and suffering. If you listen in order to make the mind Dhamma and practice so that you see Dhamma, you will finish with the problems of this life. It can end here. Understand that things do not exist for you to be able to season, modify, or improve them. They are just unalterable nature, the way they are, arising and passing away. When you have studied and practiced Dhamma, you understand that the Buddha did not teach to fix things, but to see according to truth. If you want to change things, that is not Dhamma, that is not truth. It is just the habit of someone who wants to create and manipulate. If you don't, do not see the truth of the way things are, there is no path to practice, and you are outside of the noble truths of suffering, its cause, its cessation, and the path. Since the very beginning of the Buddha's dispensation, for those who hear and practice, there has not been any requirement to adjust or modify things, only to know and surrender. Wisdom is that which knows ac according to the truth of sankhara, or conditioned phenomena. 
However sankhara are, that is what we need to know. Sankara have their nature to arise and pass away. Any other view of things is impure dhamma, the teaching of ignorance embedded in the heart. There will be no cessation, the wheel turning endlessly, no solution, no end, no way to stop. It's like insects crawling on the rim of a water barrel. They are always moving, but they aren't going anywhere only traveling around and around the rim. The thoughts of ordinary benighted beings are the same. There is no finish or resolution. They just remain in the same old place. We may think we are headed far away, but we are only going around in circles, always coming back to the same place. We don't see this cycle in the heart because there is no wisdom to see. We rely on delusion as our wisdom, and real wisdom is nowhere to be found. This ignorance becomes the manager. There is no standard to practice by, and things get out of hand. This is not Dhamma. In Dhamma we want to see, according to the Buddha's words. This means seeing that there is no solution, nothing to change or adjust, because Dhamma is always complete as it is. So we give up trying to control. We can't increase or decrease things. We tend to think that things aren't right, that they are too big or too small. Why are they too big or too small? Because of our perception. Such is merely the deluded desire of uninstructed people. It is as foolish and tiring as someone boxing and wrestling with a tree. So the Buddha advised us to see according to Dhamma. Whatever we may perceive has its existence according to nature and merely that. If we have awareness that knows according to Dhamma, then no matter what things arise, there is no unhappy result. Whatever may happen to the body will not affect us. We will see that there is no profit from compounded phenomena, and we will remain unshakable in our own place, all things pacified. The Buddha said to investigate this body and the other foundations of mindfulness. There is nothing to solve or undo. We just need to know according to the truth. The body experiences birth, aging, and death. There is nothing stable in it. Know that, that this reality is Dhamma. It is the truth. There is nothing to change, destroy, or solve. When you get to this point, there is nothing more to say. There is no more burden to carry. If you know according to truth, there is no heedlessness about what you are doing wherever you may be. You just see things as they are, conditions arising and passing away. Then what will you seek? What will you get upset and cry about? What do you want to toil and suffer over? What do you want to have or be? When will you say things are big or small, long or short? In the end, what will you say about nature? There is this cycle of existence, and that is all. When you see this profound truth, you will be at peace, free, without sorrow, in conflict with no one. I'll leave it there for now today. So open it up for questions, if anyone has any questions. Uh, Longpore, some people practice uh, diligently, mm -hmm. and some people don't. Yeah. Uh, what would you say are things that uh, weaken determination to practice? Well, you know, I think one of the... Uh, so, you know, it, it does require diligence. Um, also, sometimes, you know, diligence is is uh, is much more of an internal mindset than and and uh, an external form. It's like uh, there's a, a reading I read a few days ago of Ajahn Chah talking about um, watching his his own teacher. Um, who would, you know, you wouldn't do a whole lot of walking meditation and and you wouldn't sit for that long. But he accomplished a lot more in that time than, than Ajahn Chah did while he's striving up and down and sitting for hours on end because it's about the mind. Um, that said, uh, that requires uh, uh, you know, an exceptional form of diligence uh, to be mindful and alert and present. Um, 
so that uh, you know, I think it's just taking an really taking. An, I mean, d diligence comes from really taking an interest uh, in the uh, in the nature of mind and the nature of of our existence and and that sense of you know reflecting on the you know, reflecting on the drawbacks of of uh, of uh, physical existence of our emotional existence of our mental proliferations and and views and opinions our stands that we make just really understanding the the drawback and the limitation uh, that is that that sets about a sense of diligence much more than than uh, you know you know standing behind standing behind yourself with a figurative kind of whip sort of beating you along trying to you know beat you into submission somehow yeah i was wondering if you could speak on um sanya as memory uh, versus just perception as it's usually considered um well i mean it's a it's it's a it's a mixture between the two um like to perceive something is to is to ha and, and 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 one of its maybe one of its basic functions is to to name things to have a a name a category uh, in in Thai when they translate sanya um, it is the uh, ability to to remember but also to give things. Um, solidity and importance, and so that one one, uh, and that, that r r relies on on r remembering to a certain degree, but then it's also the that 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 that, that quality of, of of having a a name or a category or a recognition that this is something that is it, it has an importance a value. In the uh, uh, in the suttas, oftentimes when the Buddha defines uh, sanya, he defines it as that ability to. So the, when one sees something, we say, "This is blue. This is yellow. This is red." Sort of, you know, one is out of memory and having a, 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 a things coalescing into a, a, a concrete kind of form um, so the same would be uh, you know, in terms of sound and, and uh, smell taste touch and of course thought processes uh, they coalesce otherwise it's you know, I mean it doesn't take mu much meditation to realize much of your thoughts are a jumbled mess you know <laughs> so and we keep we keep, we keep you know, figuring out patterns and whatnot, but that's a function of, of sanya perception. Yes, Linda. Uh, this is a bit unformulated, so um, feel free to say anything that feels relevant. Um, it, what really struck me from the sutta was um, the conditions of kamma consciousness and tanha as the conditions for existence, mm -hmm. and I'm just reflecting on them and thinking about the relationship between them, and if there's anything else you can just expound on about those three <coughs> things. Well, I think one of the things is 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 seeing seeing it as a you know as a process that that is, and and that's uh, that's why I, I say the the illustration of the different forms of seed or propagation uh, is a good way of, of you know, seeing that these are that, you know, this is kind of a process that 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 different things have to have to sort of come together in order for this movement toward toward being or becoming or existence to to take place and and that uh, um, really identifying uh, these different impulses or different factors uh, so that one is is able to release or relinquish or have a sense of of uh, um, 
dispassion or or a sense of uh, you know, nipida, sort of uh, kind of a weariness of this this constant you know, uh, buying into the process. It's not that we, and it's not that we don't have feelings or bodies or sense contact or whatnot, but it's that we we understand it. Uh, yes, I'm more of, uh, just kind of piggybacking off of that. Um, could you uh, maybe uh, offer like a couple of tools or approaches on how you might um, try to recognize that you're kind of just getting caught up in that process when you're in a situation that's like a lot's going on? How do, or just maybe this a couple. Is, this is suffering. <laughs> That's all. That's all. That's your primary sort of tool, recognizing the, the kind of uh, stress or distress, the uh, kind of an, an agitation, a straying away from peace and security and a sense of well-being, um, because that's that that uh, if we if we say follow these. The Buddhist teachings, or where uh, you know, have a, an inspiration in the Buddhist teachings, it's like this is uh, this is what is the path to uh, realizing true peace and and unshakeable unshakability. So that when there is, uh, we start paying attention right at that point of okay, where's this? Where, where, where did I? Where, where what did I buy into? What did I? What did I get? Conflicted about what did I, what did I, what did I object to? What did I get infatuated by? And so then we start start paying attention right at that point. 